Well, it's been requested that I try and uncover some of the ways in which theological abuse works. And I've um, got a picture there of Stephen Lett and JW.org. I couldn't turn that around the right way, but anyway, it is what it is. Probably one of the most theological abusive cults worldwide. Probably one of the most successful, financially successful cults worldwide uses business as a shop front but a very well presented cult quite easily able to get you in um, they'll love bomb you they'll make you feel as though you were meant to be there all along very similar to the way in which narcissism works and this it's it's a matrix that works across all cults the love bomb the comply We'll measure you on your compliance. Uh, if you don't comply, you'll be devalued accordingly to the compliance, even if you don't comply to false beliefs and things. It's one thing if you don't comply to things that don't deserve that. These people expect you to comply to things that are just not right. And when you come to your senses and you don't comply, um, then you are devalued the devalue will uh, deteriorate into forms of punishment shunning and these types of things until ultimately you are excommunicated completely shunned and this is all part of malignant covert theological abuse and when we turn to these passages of scripture they're not easy to undo it's not easy for the uninitiated to pull apart particularly when you start getting into sayings like be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves now that's a that's what i call a trapping passage that passage can trap you because it motivates you into believing that you need to do something or not do something to make God happy or stop him from being sad and it separates you from the finished work of Christ and then once that's accomplished your whole psychological approach towards God changes instead of being one that has come into a rest and is content in knowing that everything we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad is accomplished through our faith in Christ. Now it sounds so simple and so infantile, so kindergartenish to um, achieve. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him. And this makes religious people angry, um, just like it did the prodigal son's brother when he come back from wasting everything that he, of the inheritance that his father gave him. But the father still accepted him despite his very severe and um, confronting shortcomings humiliating shortcomings uh, it wasn't about what he did or didn't do it was about knowing that he could come back come back home and everything would be all right and this is particularly true today where the cost of living is got way out of the reach of youngsters today and they need in many cases to stay near their parents and be able to live that way Theological abuse corners you and um, embraces you by making you believe that there's something that you need to do or need not to do to keep your relationship with God healthy. But that's not true. Um, when Christ died on the cross, all our issues between ourselves and God were finished once and for all for time and eternity 
never to be worried about again. In return for your belief, you're given the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is so simple. I'm just simplifying it beyond words. I'm not even going to complicate all the different threads and things that come through the scriptures that cause confusion. For your belief in the finished work of Christ, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and all the attributes and contributes and characteristics that come into you as a result of that and you get on with your life. It is not a game of chess or a game of thrones or anything like that where day by day you're trying to navigate your life to make God happy or stop him from being sad. God sees you through Christ and that's it, through your belief. Now, that leaves you in a very complicated situation in this sense. That means you need to get on with your life and make the best of it, the best of it, with the time you have left. But what these malignant, covert, theological, abusive preachers and organizations do, because they can't navigate and use the scriptures in a way in which is beneficial to the hearers, um, enabling them to go home and get on with their lives, they turned it into a 24-7 journey of trying to make God happy or stop him from being sad. And what this does is it works against the person um, in arousing their sinful nature. This is why a lot of devoted Christians that have the wrong psychological approach to God um, ultimately fail and turn evil. Now, a lot of religious people aren't going to want to hear this, just like the prodigal son's brother didn't want to see him coming back home after everything he'd done. He didn't deserve to come back home. This is the same attitude that's going on within malignant, covert theological abuse. You're never good enough. You're never going to be good enough. And the fact of the matter is you're not. When it comes to God, you're not. That's why he made the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're never going to be right with God. That's why you need the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to add to that or take away from that, that's up you, up to you. But I've just gotten to the point where I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and I have the Holy Spirit and I'm going to make the best of that that I can. I'm going to try and do the best with that that I can. That's all I can do. That's all I have. So I get on with my life. I've lived the life of malignant covert theological abuse it's the way of our sinful nature it's the way our sinful nature <laughs> prevents us from enjoying our life with the Holy Spirit because it holds you in as I said to you before these cornering passages these malignant covert theological abusive passages be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourself. We know that Jesus said in Matthew 7 that if you keep his word, if you be wise in life, the floods will come and the winds will blow and the rains will try and wash everything away. But what's the foundation that holds the house up? The rock. Now you've got to ask yourself, well, what is the rock? Is the rock what you do or don't do to make God happy or stop him from being sad? Or is the rock the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the good news is the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you really get down to the meat and potatoes, and sorry viewers, I've got sea lice on my shoulders from hydrofoiling um, under the wetsuit. What is the golden rule at the end of the day? To love your neighbour as yourself. So you ain't loving nobody until you've got yourself sorted out. And I think that's a lifelong journey as well. And that's a whole other story. I'll go into that in the next session. But what I've done, I've laid a foundation in showing you that the rock 
the reason for all this religion and everything else is solely for you to believe in Christ and his finished work and everything that's associated with that for you to have the gift of the Holy Spirit and move on and enjoy your life all this other stuff probably isn't applicable to you um, because the main thing at the end of the day when the floods, winds, rains come is for you to believe in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ anything alongside that above that or around that that these people try and convince you to believe in and they corner you with that is malignant covert theological abuse now if you haven't already please subscribe to my channel um, encourage me to continue and I'll see you in part two of malignant covert theological abuse